Hello, everyone, and welcome to the UW School of Pharmacy alumni webinar titled Antibiotic Resistance in Gram-Negative Bacteria, Treatment Challenges, and New Options. I want to thank you for taking time this evening to join us on the webinar on this very interesting and important topic that helps to ensure our ability to continue to combat infections with antibiotics. My name is Dave Mott, and I'm the Associate Dean for Advancement at the UW School of Pharmacy, and I will be serving as the moderator for tonight's webinar. This event is being sponsored by the UW School of Pharmacy Advancement Office. We have over 40 people participating uh, in tonight's webinar. Before we get started, I want to describe the process we will use for taking questions. First, the chat function is turned off for participants. Second, due to the number of attendees, we will not be taking verbal questions. Instead, please use the Q&A feature on Zoom to type and submit your questions as you think of them. Since some of the questions may be the same across individuals, please feel free to click on the thumbs up icon to upvote for a question. Then during the Q&A session, I will read the questions with the most upvotes for Professor Rose to answer. The webinar is being recorded, and we will send you a link to the recorded webinar along with an evaluation survey for the webinar. Please check the link for the recording starting on Friday. So let's get started. Our speaker this evening is Professor Warren Rose. Warren is a faculty member in the school in the pharmacy practice division at the UW School of Pharmacy and is an expert in the area of infectious disease, particularly in antibiotic resistance. Dr. Rose's translational research interests include antimicrobial pharmacology, resistance, and host pathogen interactions. He also has an adjunct affiliate faculty appointment in the Department of Medicine, Division of Infectious Diseases, and holds clinical appointments within the departments of pharmacy at UW Health and the William S. Middleton VA in Madison. It is my pleasure to turn the program over to Professor Warren Rose. Thank you, Professor Mott. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you tonight about something other than COVID. So I'm sure we're open for an appetite for something different. And it's always exciting to talk about resistant infections and how we approach this for treatment. So I appreciate you taking the time over your evening to learn about these new issues. And I selected this topic um, primarily because resistance in gram-negative bacteria has been really a hot source of uh, burgeoning resistance throughout the last 10 years. And the Infectious Disease Society of America recently came up really for the first time with guidelines on how to address particular organisms of this class. And the way they went about addressing it was actually quite interesting. And so I thought it provided some really unique opportunities to think about how these treatment options might fit within your practice setting and where we could see it going from here. So uh, relevant disclosures are provided here. I'll talk about some of these drugs from these companies. Um, I will mention here that Acagen is no longer a viable company anymore, but has a product that's going to be mentioned um, in the slide set. So a lot has been talked about regarding the crisis of antimicrobial resistance. And um, there's a lot of estimations on the number of resistant bacteria over the next 30 or 40 years and what this will do to mortality rates if this is left unchecked. Some of that might be speculation. Some of it is based on different factors regarding if we can't produce antibiotics. But what we do know is that when we have susceptible populations, we add antibiotics just by law of evolution, resistant populations pop up over time. And with that, there's a number of factors that come into play. It costs a lot of money for us to treat these infections, uh, very resource intensive, high morbidity and mortality events are a result of that. Hospitalizations can be burdensome with long extended stays, difficulties in treating these patients, and overall transmission of pathogens from patient to patient. And then lastly, somewhat of an unmeasured problem is the problem of resource and time management in which a lot of effort would go into treating these patients regarding um, financial and intellectual means of trying to manage these patients in this setting. And so this can be within the hospital, 
community or in long-term care facilities. So it's really a potential broad problem. And as you can imagine, um, this not only is only in the US, but also worldwide is where we quickly see this. And I think the COVID example is a, uh, an example of spread of pathogens on steroids, but um, certainly bacteria have no boundaries as well. And we've seen these things transmit throughout the world quite quickly in, in relative terms. In the US, if you look at the data from the US, um, the estimates as recently as 2019 come from an antibiotic resistance report. And within the US, you can see that about 2.8 million infections due to antimicrobial resistant pathogens happen per year. And that attributes to about 36,000 deaths. Some of these may be um, directly attributable or just associated with a patient that happened to pass away, but it, they are classified as uh, AMR related infection deaths. And then you add on top of that Clostridioides difficile, which I will not talk about in this um, seminar, but it's another problematic pathogen that has really come up in numerous settings that have caused significant issues and not necessarily due to resistance, but just um, issues regarding lack of available treatment options for this pathogen and problems with reestablishing the microbiome appropriately for these patients. So what's interesting about antimicrobial resistance is there's been some data that suggests that COVID-19 may actually exacerbate the AMR problem. And, you know, it's 2020, 2021, so you have to mention every talk about COVID-19, so I put it in here. I think um, if you look at the data, they, they talk about antibiotic use for co-infection or potential bacterial and superinfections has led to some inappropriate antimicrobial use. There's growing use of biocides and disinfectants. This Attention on COVID has resulted in resources that are directed away from surveillance and so not appropriately screening patients in the right setting, allowing organisms to propagate and be transmitted. There's lack of recognizing resistance for patient isolation. Certainly there's um, good efforts towards identifying COVID-19, but um, some things have gone by the wayside regarding recognition of AMR in per certain patient populations. There's the old adage of crisis fatigue where uh, attention is directed elsewhere and it's hard to get back up and understand how this could contribute to resistance development. Drug shortages are always a problem. And then there's many other things that are left unchecked. For example, we don't direct our attention back to antimicrobial overuse in the agribusiness. So that could lead to potential issues. And so what's interesting, I'll talk about some of these gram negative pathogens in this lecture. And there's been some directly attributed spikes in organisms like Acinetobacter, for example, that have um, shown that, that if we don't direct our attention towards screening and surveillance, these gram-negative pathogens can kind of rear their ugly head under the surface. So there are a lot of mediators of antibiotic resistance. And if you think about gram-negative infections, um, they have everything in place to be able to develop resistance to anything you throw at them. And so the challenge is actually quite significant. The figure on this on this right side, I, I think it kind of comes away well. It's a little blurry from the grab I took from the publication, but um, if you look at the top right corner, there's the underlying issue of persistence or biofilms that are formed that allows the organism to survive in various surfaces. I'm not going to get into that tonight. That's a whole nother mechanism and potential treatment challenge, but um, that can be a whole nother talk in and of itself. But that is underlying this whole problem of, of lack of therapeutic efficacy. But if you look at the antimicrobial resistance, you can see there are a diverse range. You have an activation of, of antibiotics. The classic thing we think about here are beta-lactamases that are produced, and I'll talk about those and some of the therapeutic implications. There's uh, aminoglycoside enzymes that modify the antibiotic and lead to deactivation. There's cell wall changes, if you look um, going counterclockwise at the bottom left corner, and uh, leading to variations in cell wall metabolism changes in binding sites like penicillin binding protein mutations or extra PBPs that are derived from in the organism to counteract penicillins. Methyltransferases also uh, lead to issues regarding target site modification. And then there's porin alterations or efflux pumps that allow the organism to counteract the antibiotic by pumping it out of the cell or preventing it from transmitting through a membrane. So certainly they have all of these in place and these are just propagated from antimicrobial exposure. 
And if you think about the organisms that we're going to talk about tonight, they fall under the classical escape type pathogens. And you can see on the left side of the slide, those are described for you. Um, but prominently here um, in, in gram negatives, um, the last four, the CAPE organisms are part of that pathway. And in this lecture, we'll talk about Klebsiella pneumoniae, Pseudomonas, and Enterobacter as part of the Enterobacter alleys classification. So what is difficult to describe sometimes to general audiences is just the beta-lactamase classification. And I'm not sure that's doing any justice to try to simplify it, but I received this slide from the person who created the classification, Dr. Karen Bush out of Indiana University. And this is her best way of describing it. So I can think of no better way to talk about them than use her words. Um, and so if you think about beta-lactamases, they're classified into serine and metallo-beta-lactamases in the gram-negative class. And they each have substrates and major functional classes that lead to deactivation of different beta-lactams. And so this slide breaks it down nicely. I'm not gonna go into great detail, but what I wanted to focus on is that there are beta-lactamases that degrade penicillins, cephalosporins, and carbapenems. And so we'll talk about um, the importance of those and thinking about the major treatment options as we go forward. And I'll refer back to this as we get into some of the treatment options for the resistant organisms. What's interesting about beta-lactamases is that they are, um, one, they're increasing in number, but also their uniqueness is increasing. So if you look at this study, again, this is another slide that was provided by Dr. Karen Bush, and uh, she's described how beta-lactamases are very diverse, and their diversity is actually increasing. So you can see how this could be a significant treatment challenge for this going forward, because new ones pop up um, constantly, and counteracting these is, is very, very difficult. So important in understanding antimicrobial resistance and trying to direct your antibiotic to treat a particular pathogen is the importance of diagnostics. And so if there are any stewardship folks in the audience, you understand the importance of diagnostic stewardship. And if you have that in place at your institution, you are uh, having a big advantage of trying to counteract and provide a precise treatment option for your patients. But diagnostic stewardship is the appropriate use of laboratory testing to guide patient management. It sounds very simple, but there are a lot of things in place that need to happen in order for it to function properly. First, you have the patient who is evaluated, and then diagnostic stewardship comes into place where you think about having the right test for the right patient at the right time, obviously focusing really well and leading into antimicrobial stewardship. So the diagnostic test is ordered, and then inter intervening on that test is critically important. So just because the tests are in place does not necessarily mean they're going to be acted on. You kind of have to have a middle person in there or a program in place that can act on that test result. Again, sounds very simple, but it's been shown that if you do not have that in place and optimally functioning, it makes it very difficult to actually make an impact on the test result. And so the stewardship interventions allow for right interpretation of the antimicrobial at the right time, and hopefully that leads to optimal management. So it's really a partnership between clinical laboratories, pharmacists, and infectious disease clinicians all working together. Um, but some studies have shown that pharmacists are one of the most critical means of being able to transmit the laboratory data to the patient to maintain optimal treatment for that person. And then ultimately, we hope to improve the coordination of clinical trials by using these. Again, some of the, the, the issues with clinical trials is that they um, may treat a number of, have a number of different organisms or different resistance in that in, in patient populations. Um, and so you're not able to discern certain phenotypes or genotypes from the clinical trials that could be beneficial. So redesigning clinical trials, this could be a way that could be done. And then obviously improving the care of individual patients at your institution. There are a lot of available diagnostic tests for gram-negative bacteria. This is just a sampling of those that are available. Um, and you can see there are a number of different manufacturers, different technologies ranging from PCR to mass spectrometry to, to um, um, fluorescence in situ hybridization, which allow for differentiation of organisms and um, identification of different resistance mechanisms. However, if you look at the resistance genes that can be identified, there are very few of these that actually do this. And you can see um, that you have the three of them that are able to identify particular gram-negative resistance types. And those are, those are the ones I referred to on the previous slide in the beta-lactamase production standpoint. Um, 
So few of those, maybe you have some of those in place at your institution and are utilizing them. And that would be an interesting uh, conversation to have and think about how you've implemented these protocols. But again, you can see the power that these things can have. They have a very fast turnaround time. And so you have uh, anywhere from one to two hours, you can get a result. And we know that intervening on a patient to get the right antimicrobial on board quickly for severe infections greatly improves their outcome and significantly reduces their mortality. So these are really big impactful things that you can do in your laboratory and clinical setting. As we say with wine, 20 something was a good year where it turns out that that 2010 to 2020 was a very good decade for antimicrobial development. So if, if you talked about this prior to this past decade, you would see a rapid decline um, that has happened in the last 30 years. But the recent uptick in development has been quite promising. So if you look at the timeline in 2010, it's hard to believe it's been 11 years ago, but ceftaroline was introduced onto the market. And then 2011, we had fedaxomycin. None of these are gram negative focused organ antibiotics. 2014, we had uh, four antibiotics of that ceftolazane tazobactam I will talk about further in this talk. Um, you kind of get into the wars of V, X, Y, and Z as far as nomenclature here. But in 2015, ceftazidine, mivibactam came on. And then uh, 2017, you had two antibiotics. 2018, three. And then 2019, you had three. And um, you, this is a, a big improvement. If you look overall, if you see 2015 to 2019, most of those antimicrobials are focusing heavily on trying to treat very drug-resistant gram-negative infections. Um, so you can see a very big focus to that critical need for patients. So with that knowledge, we have a lot of new agents that have come onto the market. And interestingly, the IDSA, the Infectious Disease Society of America, identified that there's a really big need to, under, to, to create a guideline or a guidance document to understand how we would try to treat these, these pathogens. And so with that, they developed a guidance and guideline on treating gram-negative resistance. Um, for the first time, this is, um, they had some prior uh, guidelines on antimicrobial resistance, but this is really one of the first that focuses on a broad range of pathogens to um, recommend particular options. So it helps guide some of the uh, use of these new agents that have come on board. And so they classified this into three different types, um, extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing enterobacteriales or ESBLEs, carbapenem resistant enterobacteriales, uh, CREs, and then lastly, difficult to treat DTR, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So we'll go through each of these and uh, talk about the recommendations from the IDSA. As I mentioned on my title slide, one of the interesting aspects is the way they went about this guideline. And this was um, published in, or um, it was published in 2020, about September of 2020. Um, and they didn't do it by the typical approach. So many of you that have looked at guidelines, you know that they use the grade system to provide a level of strength of the recommendation and the quality of the evidence to come up with the recommendation. For example, a 1A recommendation or a, a 2B recommendation uh, based on that. But this is not what they did for the IDSA guideline for the first time. And they're using this grading, they're using this new approach and trying to really counteract um, rapidly resistant and really contemporary problems in the clinical infectious disease setting. So what they did is they looked at rapidly evolving topics such as AMR that are limited by prolonged timelines to generate new or updated clinical practice guidelines. One of the big problems with ID guidelines is the time it takes for them to be developed. And by the time they're developed, again, you're having an organism or an infection that is changing. And by the time it's put into place, it can be outdated. So this is a way that they could try to get something out quickly by reviewing the literature and then being able to update it as necessary very quickly without having to change an entire document. Interestingly, the guidance documents or the guidelines that they produce will address specific clinical questions. And you might have seen this for those of you that have looked at the COVID guidelines, for example, that came out last year from the IDSA. They're answering particular clinical questions related to the new literature. And this uh, gram-negative guideline was the first to do that. They are comprehensive, but they're not necessarily systematic. So again, a different change in how we look at the way that you grade the evidence but it's a review of the literature that is comprehensive and the expert panel then decides on the recommendation. 
The IDSA hopes over time that the guidance documents may be transitioned into a grade style format, but as of now, they live as a, a guidance document to specifically address pathogen and clinical questions. And again, the gram negative guideline was chosen by the IDSA uh, as the first way to trial this new approach. So first we'll talk about extended spectrum beta lactamase producing intrabacteriales. So I took this slide from the CDC. This is something that's more directed towards the public um, to help them understand antibiotic resistance, but it does provide some nice overview of general aspects of these pathogens. So ESBL organisms are very problematic because we have very few options that are remaining for treatment. And what we do have, we tend to overuse them. And so what this slide shows you is a number of hospitalizations, deaths from 2017. This was published in 2019. And then the healthcare costs are pretty extensive. But troubling what you see at the bottom right-hand corner is that the number of infections over time are dramatically increasing. Um, and so if left unchecked or and otherwise um, left to spread, this could be a significant, more significant problem. And then as you look at some of the bullet points, uh, I think one of them that relate to what we have difficulties with in the clinical setting is that a lot of, all of the antibiotics really have to be used as IV products. And we have limited oral availability, at least empirically for treating these pathogens. And, um, you know, that's, we'll talk about some of those issues <clears throat> and how those will be addressed in the future. So again, they took the guiding, uh, the guideline of the guidance document and they tried to answer particular clinical questions. So ESBLs cause a lot of urinary tract infections. And um, <clears throat> you see that this is divided into uncomplicated cystitis and then pyelonephritis and uncomplicated urinary tract infections. So what they recommend for uncomplicated cystitis, they prefer using nitroforantoin or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole and then the opportunities to use alternatives are there given if the top two agents are not uh, tolerable or unavailable to the patient. Those include amoxicillin, single dose aminoglycosides or oral phosphomycin. And they, they talk about oral phosphomycin because there's an IV version that is in development and may or may not be approved relatively shortly. They discourage the use of fluoroquinolones primarily because uh, it's not due to resistance. Most of the organisms that cause this are susceptible but um, mostly because of the adverse uh, effects and the problems with quinolones that we have in multiple settings and the super infections that can result from fluoroquinolone use. Um, Carbapidums, they like to reserve as last line agents. And then there's some data with doxycycline that, that shows that it's not as effective as the other agents that are listed here. As far as polynephritis and complicated urinary tract infections, you see a different approach here because you need the antibiotics to get to the site of infection, which those in uncomplicated cystitis that were preferred do not. So you look at a change to IV related <clears throat> products like ergopenem, meropenem, <clears throat> imipenem, celastin, which I'll refer to just as imipenem going forward without the celastin component, um, ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. They don't recommend nitrofurantoin again because of the renal, um, the renal parenchyma where this drug does not reach in sufficient quantity. Same with fosfomycin, and then I talked about the doxycycline limitations above. So how about ESBLs outside of the urinary tract? I think we're getting to more complicated situations here as we go forward. The previous recommendation was fairly straightforward, uh, but the, what they recommend, um, now it seems kind of obvious, but they recommend carbapenems for treatment, primarily derived from the well-published well Merino trial of Klebsiella pneumoniae bloodstream infections. And if you look at the trial, there's been some discussion of the application of the trial overall and some of the, the, the discrepancies between the patient populations. But this was a trial of patients treated with piperacillin tazobactam versus meropenem uh, for the treatment of Klebsiella pneumoniae bloodstream infections due to ESBL organisms that were susceptible to both agents. And so when they uh, ran the trial and looked at the 30-day mortality, they found that um, Peptazo had a higher 30-day mortality. And this was found not to be non-inferior to meropenem. It's kind of a odd way of thinking about it, but in a sense, they couldn't determine that it was non-inferior to meropenem. And if you look at the risk difference between the two drugs, it's actually quite high. So the risk difference between the two for mortality is 8.6 fold difference. So from that, um, carbapidem still maintained, uh, according to the guidance document, to, to be the recommended therapy. However, you could step down to oral therapy if so needed. Um, if 
you could have a susceptible organism, treat them with fluoroquinolones, or I should say, or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole if it's susceptible, if the patients are afebrile and hemodynamically stable, if there's appropriate source control that's achieved, and if there are no issues with any absorption problems in the patient. There's still some um, thoughts about using cefepime or piptazo for patients that have ESBL organisms. Um, and what the guidance document recommends is saying no to piptazo. It's kind of a catchy term, except you have to add cefepime as well. But um, there's, it's a nice way of, of guiding people to use carbapenems because um, even though they appear sometimes to be susceptible based on the previous data, and the poor outcome difference that they found in the Merino trial, um, they really recommend avoiding these agents. Some of the reasons why this might have occurred is that there could be reasons of inaccurate susceptibility testing or po poor reproducibility. So um, the, the methods that could be used may not actually accurately reflect the actual resistance phenotype. Um, plus there could be presence of inducible resistance genes or multiple beta-lactamases, which are more likely to affect piptazo and cefepime versus what you might see with a covered venom. Then there's another recommendation on um, providing therapy based on available testing. And this is a little complicated to go through, but I provided the, um, the classification on, this, on the right hand of the slide to give you an example of, of how this would be determined. Um, but they looked at, and they're looking at whether an ESBL is present and what the phenotype is. So if the resistance to ceftriaxone and the ESBL test is negative, then you can determine uh, or treat the patient based on susceptibility results that you have on hand. If it's a bloodstream infection, it's recommended um, if it's resistant to ceftriaxone, but it has a CTXM beta-lactamase, such as you can see on the right side of the slide. Um, um, if that's not detected, but still remains resistant to ceftriaxone, then they still recommend carbapenems because as you can see, um, there's a lot of other ESBL genes that could be present in these organisms. And reliably, we know that carbapenems would perform very well in that situation. So then moving on to some of the more problematic resistant organisms because it really degrades some of the, um, some of the available options we talked about, particularly the covered penum class. So these are covered penum resistant enterobacteriales. And if you look at the slide set on the uh, nomenclature, these are referred to as commonly KPCs, OXAs, uh, enzymes, and MDMs, so the non metallo beta lactamases. Um, and I, I underline KPCs because those are the ones that are predominating within the United States and ones that you're likely to see if you would have a, a CRE organism as far as the genotype. So for CREs, you can see they're not very common, but the potential threat is pretty large because of the lack of available treatment options historically. And so this has 13,000 cases with 1,000 deaths in 2017, and they're isolated to certain geographical regions throughout the country, but they're not limited to that. Um, but so you can see that the costs are fairly significant for a small number of cases, and the cases are slightly going up, which is also, as I mentioned, pretty significantly concerning here. So again, the, the, the potential for these organisms is due to causing infection in numerous sites, but commonly you will see them in urinary tract infections. So again, the guideline broke them down by cystitis and pyelonephritis. Um, and what they prefer for uncomplicated cystitis are cipro, levo, trimethoprim sulfa, nitrofurantoin, or single dose aminoglycoside. So um, the take home here is that they're using drugs that have very high uh, concentrations within the bladder and can be used very efficiently. Some alternatives that could be used include meropenem if it's ertapenem susceptible but still remains, sorry, ertapenem resistant but remains susceptible to meropenem. Um, and if you don't have carbapenemase testing available to determine otherwise. And then other alternatives include ceftazidime, avobactam, meropenem, vaborbactam, imipenem, rilobactam, or cefiterocol. And these are, as you can guess, uh, beta lactam, beta lactamase inhibitors and the first three, and the last drug is a, a new cephalosporin that's a siderophore mimicking agent. And I have information on that, but I'm not gonna go into that, organism, uh, that antibiotic in great detail. And then as a last resort, using colistin is um, on the charts as far as something you can use, probably would want to avoid if at all possible. Um, but colistin or polymyxin E is one of the last resort antibiotics that could be used if the alternatives or the preferred are not available.
And keep in mind not to use polymyxin B because it doesn't reach the uh, bladder in sufficient qualities to actually treat these organisms. So we're talking just about polymyxin E in this situation. Second, with polynephritis and complicated urinary tract infections, um, you're seeing uh, more of the systemic type of antibiotics in the alternative class above, ceftazidine, mavibactam, meropenem, babobactam, imipenem, rilobactam, or cefiterical. And if you look at the data for cefiterical, it's not impressive when you look at things outside of the urinary tract, but the uh, guidance document determined that there wasn't enough evidence to say otherwise for urinary tract infections because it gets into the urine at such high concentrations. The alternatives could be extended infusion meropenem, again, if it's ertapenem resistant, but meropenem susceptible. So as far as treatment of CRE outside of the urinary tract, this is where they break it down even further on um, different agents according to enzyme class. But if you look at CRE that are resistant to ertapenem, but susceptible to meropenem, the preferred agent again here, as we talked about in the previous slide, is extended infusion meropenem. Um, the alternative here is ceftazidime avibactam. Typically here you avoid agents like meropenem, they were bactam or imipenem rilobactam. They didn't, they deter, determined that these drugs don't provide sufficient evidence over meropenem alone for treatment in this situation. For uh, CRE that are resistant to both ertapenem and meropenem, um, the preferred agent here is ceftazidine mavibactam, meropenem babobactam, and, or excuse me, or imipenem rilobactam. And then as a last resort, as I mentioned previously, cefidicol had some difficult data to go through as far as the outcomes in patients that had severe bloodstream infections outside of the urinary tract. That, that group had increased mortality in the clinical trials. And so they said it's an option because it appears susceptible, but questionable on whether this drug would perform well in that situation. But if the preferred agents are not available, that is a drug that could be turned to. If you know what the carbapenemase is, then you can direct your therapy specifically to the organism of interest. So in, um, the carbapenemase production is present, the preferred agents here, and typically, as I talked about with the um, uh, agents in the US with the KPCs that are primarily in the US, the preferred agents are ceftazidine, bevobactam, meropenem, bevobactam, or imipenem, rilobactam. If it's a metallobeta-lactamase or an OXA48-like enzyme, which are predominantly outside of the US, but if you have someone coming in from outside of the US that could harbor these enzymes, then the agents that are recommended are ceftazidime, avibactam, plus actreonam, or cefidrocol monotherapy. And uh, in the oxa 48 you have ceftazidime, avibactam as preferred agent, or cefidrocol as an alternative. So I mentioned briefly about polymyxins and there's a whole guidance document on polymyxins that are, that are available. That was published in 2019 before this new gram negative guideline was published. Um, and as you can see, polymyxins have been knocked down the list as far as where you would use them because we have better agents and we have agents that are less toxic. But if you do need to use it, there's a nice guideline that goes through the dosing protocols and considerations for polymyxins. This includes colistin, polymyxin E, and polymyxin B. So as you can realize, the issues with polymyxins versus the comparative agents, which are commonly beta-lactam derived products, is that polymyxins have increased mortality and in, typically in that arm, at least for the studies that have been done, and they have excess nephrotoxicity. So, and that, that's one of the reasons why they've been knocked down the list as far as available treatment options. And then lastly, we have difficult to treat Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, and the way that they classified the difficult to treat Pseudomonas aeruginosa was by resistance. And we know that multidrug resistant Pseudomonas is a problem. As you can realize, any healthcare setting is going to run into this organism. There's a lot of hospitalizations, a fair number of deaths and healthcare costs associated with it. The cases over time, this is from at the bottom from 2012 to 2017, have declined a little bit, which is great. And they've attributed a lot of that to some of the infection control practices that have occurred and are able to identify and isolate patients to prevent transmission. But it still remains a significant healthcare and health uh, hospital associated pathogen. They again break down Pseudomonas based on its site of infection and uncomplicated cystitis and pyelonephritis. 
And you can see here, the, or, the agents changed compared to what we had talked about a little bit previously. So in uncomplicated cystitis, the preferred options here are septolazine, tazobactam, ceftazidime, avobactam, imipenemrelobactam, cefiterocol, or the use of a single dose aminoglycoside. As an alternative, colistin would be something that could be recommended as an alternative. Again, polymyxin E only because polymyxin B does not get there in sufficient quantity for treatment. Not recommended here is oral fosfomycin, primarily because the organisms have an inherent enzyme called uh, a, fo a, a FOS enzyme that, that actually degrades fosfomycin and uh, creates resistance very rapidly. So fosfomycin is not recommended for the use in Pseudomonas. Second, for pyelonephritis and complicated urinary, traction, urinary tract infections, you see overall a similar picture um, where the preferred agents are the beta-lactam type drugs and the alternatives here would be aminoglycosides. As far as outside of the urinary tract, it's difficult to assess this primarily because the majority of studies in clinical trials do not include patients with these types of organisms. They commonly have pseudomonas, but they don't always have these difficult to treat organisms. And so they, they take available information from the clinical trials in small subgroups or from expert opinion. But the preferred agents are septolazine, tazobactam, ceftazidime, avobactam, or imipenemrelobactam. And it's important to note that we've talked a lot about these three agents. Which one do you consider? Um, generally, septolazine tazobactam is um, the highest susceptibility um, in pseudomonas among those three options. And primarily, this is because septolazine itself is active against pseudomonas, and so very active against pseudomonas. So it retains really good activity um, compared to the other agents in this classification. Alternatives here would be cefiterocol when the preferred agents are unavailable due to intolerance or resistance for the reasons we mentioned above because it performed poorly in the treatment of uh, multidrug resistant infections outside of the urinary tract. And then again, aminoglycosides, um, they do have them as an alternative, but they recommend it only for uncomplicated bloodstream infections. And then not recommended, even though it's very hard to get, um, but plazomycin, which is an aminoglycoside agent um, that uh, doesn't have a good parent company at the moment, but it's one that uh, they don't recommend for this, this setting. So then lastly, they did break down the combination therapy in all the organisms I talked about, um, but I just relegated it into this last slide to combine them kind of all together because they basically said the same thing. And I just wanted to go over that because for those of you that have been practicing for a number of years, combination therapy in gram negatives has been used. And so um, even not only empirically, which we can still do, but also directed therapy. Um, but what they recommended in the guideline is that combination therapy should not be routinely recommended um, for directed therapy. Certainly it has a role in empiric therapy because you wanna broaden your coverage and try to cover the most likely pathogen with one active agent. But then once you know what the susceptibility is, um, the role of combination is diminished because um, they found that beta-lactam agents demonstrate very high activity in vitro and reliable activity. And when they're susceptible, they tend to work fairly well. And so the additional benefit of another drug, um, like say uh, an aminoglycoside or a polymyxin or a, a fluoroquinolone offers potentially more harm than good for patients. And the harm is related not only to the adverse events, so in polymyxins and aminoglycosides, we think about nephro and ototoxicity, but um, also in microbiome disruptions, which can lead to superinfections and C. Diff C. difficile overgrowth that can be very problematic for, for patients. So importantly, what's in the guidelines is also what's not in the guidelines. And so um, the, the guideline did a very good job of trying to present the first case of directing pathogen-specific therapy. Uh, but they did note they were not able to address everything. Um, and the hope is with a living guidance document like this, they can go back and make recommendations on some organisms. But some key gram negatives that they left out include carbapenem resistant acinetobacter. This is a, a pseudomonas like organism that infects patients in the hospital setting, primarily uh, complicated pneumonias like ventilator associated pneumonia. But the, the problem here is that this is a very drug resistant pathogen, number one. And we don't have a lot of antibiotics to treat it. In fact, very few of the ones I mentioned of, of the new products would have activity against this organism. So um, it doesn't cause a lot of cases, but again, you can see 
the populations that it would in fact would be very vulnerable and the lack of available treatment options would be significant. On the other hand, with gonorrhea, um, there's nothing in the guideline that's recommended here for the, uh, this. It's relegated to the sexually transmitted infection guidelines and um, you can find that information there, but it's a, a significant problem because very few options have activity once you get past the primary therapies. So um, that wasn't in the guidelines, but it's in another guideline somewhere else. So I just wanted to point that out. Other things here include a lack of really a cost benefit analysis. So the question is, how do we balance pharmacoeconomics and um, undollarable issues like quality of life um, in, in patients? So how do we spend wisely on products that we know will have a benefit? Uh, and so that's some work that's ongoing at UW Health that we hope to be able to um, provide some guidance on that through publications. But as of now, the guideline does not recommend anything. Also, it particularly points out that the duration of therapy is uh, not addressed in the guideline. And um, you can find information on treatment of the various infection types like urinary tract infections and pneumonias that recommend durations. But in this guideline, it doesn't go through that. And the same with empiric therapy. It doesn't really address any of that. It's talking specifically about directing your therapy based on the pathogens that are presented and what you would use in those situations. And then lastly, special populations are always important. Again, the, the clinical trials have a hard time addressing these because they are in such limited quantity or they're excluded from their clinical trials. But things like cystic fibrosis patients, which are known to have infections with pseudomonas in a different way. And so how do you, how do you treat those, uh, those infections? It's not in the guideline, but can be found elsewhere. And then also tr things like transplant recipients where they are significantly immunocompromised and have other comorbidities. So what I would like to end on is just thinking about future antimicrobial therapeutics. This is an interesting review that was presented in 2020, and I just thought it had some interesting elements to it because it talks about um, not only where these drugs are going to come from. So there's another more information about who's producing them. Is it academia? Is it industry? Is it uh, other industries that are involved, government agencies? But then what are the molecules exactly being produced? And they looked at the pipeline and they found over, four, over uh, 407 preclinical antibiotic projects from 314 institutions, most of them being small or medium-sized industry biotech companies. Um, the majority of these are small, uh, or sorry, direct acting small molecules. And um, encouragingly, I was actually surprised to see this, encouragingly, 70% of them are new molecules uh, or new targets, and only 20% are old. So it's, it's nice to see some innovation that's being developed to try to combat this problem. And then we know that gram negatives are a significant pathogen and have really high resistance potential. And so it's also good to know that half of them are targeting gram negative infections. There's still a lot of potentiators out there, such as beta-lactamase inhibitors um, or protectors of ways to prevent a molecule from being degraded. So those make up a portion um, we've seen antibodies and vaccines play a role in a number of things recently with COVID. So there could be some hope against select pathogens that I talked about, um, immunomodulators, antivirulence approaches. And then there's been some really cool reports of phage and microbiota differences and, and interventions that have occurred in select patients that have made huge differences for that particular patient. So hopefully that can be more of a um, biological warfare against pathogens instead of trying to chemically go about it. So leading to that, what are we thinking about coming soon? I, I guess it's 2021, so I should have said streaming soon at a setting near you instead of coming soon to a setting near you. But um, here we have those that are filed for FDA approval, January 2021, solopenem, which is an orally available carbapenem antibiotic, is um, under review and it's actually a fast track review, which means they should have a decision very, very soon. And then in phase three trials, there's a number of different agents. As you can see, a lot of them are cefepime plus a beta-lactamase inhibitor. But there's another um, uh, carbapenem, which has the name orapenem. I think you can guess it's probably orally available, and that is the case. Um, so that's another one that might come to market very soon. And then there's a couple of other uh, topoisomerase inhibitors. I'm not going to bother to try to pronounce those. They look very complicated. We'll figure it out when they get to market. But they inhibit topoisomerases and particularly targeting very resistant organisms. In fact, the one here, uh, Zoloflotacin, is um, treating uh, particularly gonorrhea.
And then they have one that's coming on board, maybe with, for the treatment of C. difficile, which looks quite promising. And so to end, I just wanted to talk about, we've approached antibiotic resistance heavily today and using antibiotics to try to treat those pathogens. But there's a number of things to go into play. And we referred to this on the one of the previous slides on what's in development. But um, we see in the future, antibiotics are only gonna play a part in trying to reduce resistance spread and get things under control. Um, other factors like what I talked about with phage um, or, uh, types of molecules, antibodies, improving our diagnostics, taking into account the host to try to augment the antibiotic therapy. And then uh, hopefully understanding more about the microbiome can play a huge role as we look towards vaccines to try to solve the problem. So that's all I have for you today. I really appreciate the time over the evening for this on a Wednesday evening. Um, thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Participants, please feel free to use the Q&A function in Zoom if you have a question for Dr. Rose. Okay, uh, Warren, here's a question. Um, is, virul is virulence also a big problem for gram-negative bacteria? Sorry, I was muted. Um, Absolutely. So some of the evidence, so what you typically think about resistance is that the trade-off is an organism becomes resistant, it gives up, up some virulence. Um, it, actually, in gram-negatives, it's been shown, particularly with pseudomonas, that that does not happen. They actually can become more virulent by taking on additional resistance genes. And so um, I, I don't know that, that, that the answer is universally yes, but uh, I think it's a problem that, um, number one, they don't give that up. And then secondly, there's a lot of crosstalk between microbes that um, are problematic and, and lead to this high degree of virulence in these patients. All right, uh, next one is, uh, do you think IV phosphomycin will ever come to the US market? I would anticipate a year ago that it would, um, because the problems with it coming were more manufacturing based and not as much clinical trial um, data based, but um, we think those would be straightened out very quickly and I haven't been straightened out to my knowledge. So I don't know if there's something hanging the, the system up. Um, so the question refers to the US market. So that drug is available in Europe and the European Union and other countries throughout the world. And so um, I, I don't know that it, it I don't know, it's a, it's a good question. I would say if it would have happened, it would have happened by now. I'm surprised it hasn't. So I'm increasingly less likely that it's going to. Okay, uh, the next one is, uh, which mechanism of action for the antibiotics in development do you think is most promising? <laughs> it's like trying to pick my favorite child. Um, <laughs> I, I think, um, I like the potentiators because we know how they work if we can get them to work. For example, um, the beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitors, when they do work, are fantastic drugs because they have the ability to augment the immune system. They, um, you know, you can deactivate the mechanism. I, so those are always great when we can get them to work. The problem is they may be very fleeting because we know eventually they'll overcome them. Um, but having an arsenal of them, I think, is very good because we can attack them from different directions or at least different ways and try to go around how they would develop resistance. Okay, there's just a couple more. Uh, the next one is any theories on how well the oral carbapenem will work? I think um, the, so the one I did mention um, first that is under phase three solopenem, that's actually available in India. So they it's been on the market for a little bit of time over there. Uh, I think the, the issue may be they may work too well and they may be overused, um, but they could provide a huge advantage for patients that um, can only receive IV therapy because they have a particular organism, and this could provide them an option. I think there's a lot of diagnostic stewardship that would need to be done to make sure they're used appropriately. All right, so uh, the last one, good question here is, 
Uh, will there be a need for government incentives to develop future antibiotics? There's been a lot of talk about that. That's a really good question. Uh, there have been some thought leaders that are talking about that you need a kind of a government stockpile of these medications because I think you're referring to the fact that the market for them is really not sufficient for them to be sustainable. I didn't go into that too much, but there's uh, some talk about the government kind of subsidizing these pharmaceutical companies because traditionally what we what the government has done is they'll provide some industry funding for development. So getting a drug from discovery to product, but now the issue has been once they are on the market, they can't be sustainable post-market because they have to wait a while to be picked up or they're very niche in how they were used. And so the, there's some talk about kind of a pull incentive. So they once they get to market, then you fund them for a small period of time to allow them to be um, kind of a sustainable company. Because as you saw, a lot of the drugs that I talked about that are in development are in small biotech companies. They don't have a huge Pfizer-like entity to back up um, some of their losses during the development phase. All right, we have, we have one more come in. Um, how frequently would you expect to see these resistant organisms in a case of uncomplicated cystitis versus more complicated infections, for example, uh, calf associated et cetera? I think you'd have to take into effect the patient. So you think about complicated infections like complicated urinary tract infections or catheter related infections and intravenous catheters, the patients just run into the healthcare system a lot more. And so they're able to pick up these organisms or they have antibiotic exposure. And we know those are all factors for resistance. So I don't know the numbers in particular, how many fold more likely it would be, but I'm based on that information, it's significantly higher in that population. All right. All right. That's all the questions we had. So uh, in closing, I, I want to thank everyone for attending the webinar. Uh, please join me in thanking Professor Rose with a silent round of applause. It's my favorite part of these things. Yeah. <laughs> um, please look for an email with a link to an evaluation survey so we can obtain your feedback about tonight's webinar. And other alumni engagement activities, please check out the latest edition of Discover RX, the School of Pharmacy's digital publication. And please be on the lookout for more information from us about the Day of the Badger fundraising campaign that will run on April 6th and 7th. And please consider participating as we raise funds to help our students. So again, thank you very much. Uh, please stay safe and healthy. Have a nice evening and on Wisconsin. Good night, everybody.